get your Bibles out or use your smart device that you have in front of you there and go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. I don't know about you, but I have had several people, and this is just to give God glory and how He's helping us because I'm going to tell you most of what uh, we share with you, we are learning as we go and we're receiving from our friends uh, and those that we glean from as well. It's refreshing to us. It's uh, encouraging to us. It lifts us. So if it's lifting us and encouraging us, we're trusting that as we deliver it, uh, that it refreshes you and encourages you, lifts you, helps you keep going uh, another mile, another day, uh, with a smile on your face and joy in your heart, Amen. spring in your step. And uh, so good music tonight. Thank you, Jennifer and Michaela and Brandon for leading us in worship. Uh, so go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. We're going to start with verse number 10. Tonight we're going to look at discipline. Look up here real, real quick. Discipline. And I have a question for you. And so I want you to answer this question. Uh, we can talk about it out loud before we get into it. What is discipline? Is it punishment or is it preparation? Is it punishment or is it preparation? Okay. We have to leave our assumptions at the door tonight. We have to take our preconceived ideas of church discipline, God's discipline, uh, because he does chasten those he loves. And uh, let's put our preconceived ideas out the door uh, this evening. Uh, do not be predisposed to thinking uh, as discipline in the negative. A lot of times when we talk about judgment, uh, we hear about judgment, and we automatically have a negative connotation of judgment and that God's going to judge somebody and he's going to take wrath and he's going to put him in hell to burn forever. But he already took our judgment at the cross and if you will accept that he's already taken your judgment, the only judgment that you have pending is a great uh, verdict in your favor. Yes. You know, if you're the plaintiff and you go into a courtroom and the judge drops the gavel and he rules in favor of the plaintiff, that was a favorable judgment. It wasn't a negative one. So a lot of times we come into situations and we think we know what God's talking about and we, uh, we have a, um, a preconceived idea and an assumption that it's negative and we have a, a, view, a wrong view of the Father. So we want to kind of put that to the side uh, this evening. How many of you ever played sports involved on a team? Um, did you prepare during the game or did you do your preparation before the, game? before the game? We tried to work out all of the bugs. Coach got with you and you were uh, running the plays and you were, uh, you were in going through endurance training so that you could last for all four quarters and, and you tried to work out all of the bug, bugs and you prepared. That's called discipline. That's being disciplined enough. You don't wait till the game and try to fix the problems that you had the week before, you prepare. Uh, new, another question, because questions help us learn. What's the first commandment that God ever gave to Adam and Eve? What was the first commandment that God ever gave to Adam and Eve? Multiply. To be fruitful and multiply. You guys have been listening. That's great. Because a lot would tell you that the first commandment is don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the first commandment that he gave was, of all of the trees in the garden, you can freely eat and be fruitful and multiply. So uh, there's taking that negative connotation away. Second Timothy, the third chapter. Verse number 10. Paul is writing. Now, a lot of Paul's letters he wrote to the churches. So when he wrote a letter to the church at Corinth, uh, the pastor in Corinth could get up and he could read the letter to the church. And they would be familiar with what Paul would put in the letter because it was addressing problem situations and he was admonishing them for the things that they have, were doing well in the faith. But this particular letter is not to a church. It's to young Timothy, a uh, preacher boy that Paul is mentoring. He got saved under Paul's ministry. Paul's taking him under his wing. So this letter is not to be read aloud in the church. It's to be read aloud in the pastor's office. Because it's a letter to Timothy. 
He wasn't addressing the congregation. So you have to take into consideration. Now, how do we take that? We take that as uh, followers of Christ being mentored and trained up in the way of uh, the Lord uh, and to how we can learn and be educated and we apply it to our own individual lives. That's how we take it. Okay? So he's not addressing a church, but he writes to Timothy. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. Paul is talking to Timothy. My manner of life, my purpose... My faith, the long-suffering, the love and the perseverance and the persecutions and afflictions which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. How many of them did he deliver him out of? All of them. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He's talking to a young man who is a hybrid. He's half Jew, he's half Gentile, and he has chosen to follow Christ. And because he's chosen to follow Christ and not Judaism, the Jews want to kill him. And because he's chosen Christ and not the way of some pagan god, the Gentiles are against him. So he is, this scripture, Paul is telling Timothy, all who desire in the first century... To live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And he's not talking about somebody didn't shake his hand and nobody baked him a cake for his birthday. He's talking about what Paul said to the Corinthian church, I face death eyeball to eyeball every day. And so if you're going to proclaim Christ and you're going to walk in the way of Christ, you have persecution to the point that you could be martyred. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. But... Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom, the word whom there is plural in the Greek. Whom you have learned, you have learned them. So it's from whom you have learned them. So he's not just talking about himself. There's other men that he's learned from. Verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let's stop right there. The holy scriptures. What are the holy scriptures that Paul's talking about? The Old Testament. Because at this point, the New Testament hasn't been written. If it has, it wasn't canonized and they didn't have copies of it that they could read. The printing press had not been invented. The scribes had not written them out word for word yet. So he had no access to the New Testament scriptures. So when Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, he's telling him that from your childhood, in other words, you learn the ways of Judaism, you learn the Torah, you learn from the major and the minor prophets, and from learning those, you were able to have wisdom for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. In other words, now that you've heard us teach you, and you have the Holy Scripture since your childhood, you've been able to go back through the Scriptures, and you've been able to be wise enough to find Jesus in all of the Holy Scriptures. When Jesus encounters the couple on the way to Emmaus, and he begins to expound upon the scripture, and in the scripture, he showed them himself. He was not using Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was using the prophets and the Torah and the law. So what Paul's telling Timothy here, that even in the Old Testament, the problem that we have is we're trying to tell people how to live from the Old Covenant instead of trying to find Jesus. We don't go back to the Old Covenant to tell people how to live. We go back to the Old Covenant to see Jesus. Right. Yeah. So verse 16. If we, have ex if we have established now that Holy Scripture is the Old Testament in context, he says all Scripture is given by inspiration. In other words, it is God-breathed. In the context here, and, and I believe because now we have the New Testament, we can add Old and New Testament. All Scripture is given by God, and it's God-breathed by inspiration. It's profitable. That means it's useful. What is it useful for? 
It's useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's where I want to spend time this evening. For instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. There are two dirty words in the grace circles, in the grace camps. It's like these, these two words people in the grace camps don't really want to use, and they are works and discipline. They really don't want to talk about works because if we start talking about working, people get a mentality that you have to work for your righteousness. That's not good works. Good works is because you have accepted the goodness of God, because you have had the blood applied to your life, because you have recognized the finished work and you've placed your faith and belief in that, you are saved unto good works. And your good works, James says, proves before men that you are righteous. You're not doing good works to go to God and say, look what I've done, am I righteous? No, he said you're righteous because he who knew no sin took on sin, so who we, we who were sinful could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we are righteous, and because we are righteous, we do good works. But to do good works, you have to be disciplined. And I know tonight's not going to be a hey man shout and holler in time because you're, gonna, you're trying to soak it all in, and that's, that's okay. But when we start talking about works, there is a, there's confusion that takes place because we've just told you for months and months and months and years and years now that you don't work for your salvation. It's not by any work of the law that you are made righteous. It's the work that Jesus did at the cross. However, there are good deeds and good works that we do because we are believers and because we are righteous. Uh, I mean, we feed the poor. Jesus was feeding the poor. Uh, we're clothing those that are naked. We're visiting those that are in prison. We're giving cold drinks of water to those that are thirsty. I mean, we are doing not only humanitarian efforts, but in doing that, we're sharing the goodness of God. Those are good deeds. Amen. When we support missionaries that are going into foreign lands to spread the gospel of grace, we're doing a good deed. That doesn't save us. That doesn't get us a special corner in heaven or another ounce of favor. Right. We already have all of that but it is a good work showing that we are righteous. So we do good works, but we don't do good works to be made righteous. Do we have that distinction made? Yes. Well, then the other dirty word is discipline. Because when you start talking about discipline, the first connotation that people have is correction or punishment. Uh, you, you know, people, there's a church discipline policy and we have all of these hoops that people have to jump through and it, it's just like we usually put those hoops that they have to jump through in place not so that we can restore them and bring them to reconciliation but so that they will prove that they're worthy and holy enough to be back in the position they were in. And so we punish them. There's some... God does not put cancer on people in, in, in punishment. God does not make you have a flat tire, blow up your hot water tank, empty your bank. I mean, a lot of times it's our own decisions and poor maintenance and et cetera, et cetera, that cause those types of situations. But God is not punishing you. The mentality, I've heard people say it, it, things like, if I walked in the church, I've done so much that the roof would cave in. In other words, you're saying, you're so bad that God would punish you for going to church. Huh? Yeah, punish us too. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. We're going there. Yeah, we're going there. If you don't get it answered at, by the end, you ask me again and we'll address it. But that's where we're going tonight. So all scripture, verse 16, is given by inspiration of God, God breathed, and it's profitable, profitable and use for, number one, doctrine. That's teaching. It's teaching us the truth. What has happened is we've put so much, this is, this is good. Uh, we have made more doctrine out of the footnotes and commentaries than we have the actual scripture. You know, three guys came along and the, early 1800s, Darby, Schofield, and Dake, and they wrote 
commentaries, good commentaries, a uh, little misled in some areas, but we have denominations that have formed doctrine off of the footnotes and not the actual scriptures. So the scripture is given by inspiration by God, not necessarily the commentary. Okay? And if we have the scripture and we use the scripture, it is useful for finding the truth and teaching the truth from the scripture. It's also uh, useful for reproof. Uh, this is to help us realize where, what, we're, what areas we're wrong in. Not based upon my opinion or my denomination's opinion, but based upon the scripture, it can be used for reproof to bring uh, correction and conviction in areas that were wrong. And the conviction here is not of sin. It's conviction of areas that were wrong in doctrine about if we go to the scripture, it will bring reproof and then correction in areas of, that we have error in. Where I want to pay attention to is the one that um, Sean just mentioned, the instruction in righteousness. The word instruction here is the same word in the Greek for chasten and for discipline. So this word instruction here is discipline and chasten. And it means to train, to educate, or to, to, to discipline for cultivation. Really, if you really look at it and you start breaking the word down, um, it's um, training and educating a child in every way possible. And then disciplining for cultivation wherever adults need it. So you've got training and education for a child, and even spiritually speaking, those who are immature. And then even as we become more mature as adults, we still have discipline that brings cultivation. What's that cultivation? So you can be better, not because you are bad. All right? Cultivation, so you can be better, not because you're bad. All right? So it's not, it's not, okay, you've done something bad and we've got to get that bad out. It's to cultivate you, to be, make you better, prepare you, not to punish you. And the word in the Greek here is pedia. We would spell it P-E-D-E-I-A in English, but uh, I can't give you the Greek spelling. <laughs> Then verse 17 in the New Living Translation says, God uses it to prepare and to, quit, to equip his people. All right, context, context, context. Remember, context. So if he's talking about discipline, instruction in righteousness, and the very next verse says to prepare and to equip. So he's not talking about punishment, he's talking about preparation. So the instruction in righteousness here is so that we can be trained up, educated, and disciplined in righteousness to exercise our righteousness. The word exercise, if we are exercised in the word of righteousness, the word exercise is the same Greek word where we get our English word gymnasium. So if there's training, education, and discipline, we talked about the analogy of sports, and then we're exercised in the word of righteousness, that word exercised means the same word that we get our word gymnasium. Now in the Greek, here's what the word exercise means. Strip down naked. It means to completely become naked because, here's another scripture, laying aside the weight of the sin that does so easily beset you or encumbers you so that you can run the race. Greek, we gotta think Greek. Paul's a Greek, he's thinking Greek here. He's near Athens and he's writing. So he's using a Greek word exercise and he's looking at Athens where the Olympians are training and he's seeing that when they go in to train, they take everything off. They become completely bare naked and unashamed so that when they run the race, they're not hindered. That takes discipline, huh? No, they don't have a little cloth on. She's trying to make it, they have a little cloth on. No, they stripped it all away. Yeah, she's trying to get that picture out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I, she's, he's with Lisa. I'm just trying to point out to you that nothing was hindering them. Okay? 
And so when we're disciplined and we're training, we have to take, away, take off everything in the spirit that would hinder us or that would cause us not to be disciplined uh, and that would cause us any hindrance in our race uh, that we're running. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to help you change the lens. I want to help you change the lens so that when you look at discipline, you're not thinking punishment, you're thinking preparation. Uh, when we get to the end of this tonight, I believe it's going to help you. Go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, because in Hebrews, the, thir the, the 12th chapter, we're going to three see three examples of this same phrase or word but we're going to see a different English word. We're going to see the word chasten, but it's the same exact thing, instruction in righteousness or discipline. Okay, Hebrews 12, we're going to verse 5, 7, and 8. Hebrews 12, say amen when you get there. I'm going to have to pull it up here because I forgot it's not on the screen. You got it? Okay. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Now, remember, here's what he's saying. Basically, you have forgotten that when he's giving you this exhortation that you're a son. Because the exhortation that came was to sons, not strangers and not bastards. Not Ill illegitimate children, as he's going to refer to it here in a few minutes. He's talking to you as sons. You've forgotten that. And, he, and here was the exhortation. My son, do not despise the chastening. Don't despise being chastened. Now, if you have the lens of punishment, you're going to despise it. But if you have the lens of preparation, you'll learn how not to despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. Because this chastening here is preparation. It's for cultivation. He's concerned about what you will turn out to be like. This is a father, stay on verse 5 for just a second. This is a father talking to his son and bringing chastening, discipline, training, education because he's, going, he's concerned about how his son is going to turn out. Have you ever heard us say that why do you want to act like you never met Jesus? Yes. People who aren't disciplined act like they've never met Jesus. And they despise the chastening because they think it's going to be a punishment when he's really just setting you down to train you, to educate you, and to bring cultivation to make you better because he doesn't want you to... to God hates sin because of what it does to you. God's not scared of sin. Okay? He's, he, is, he does not like and he hates what it does to his children. And that's why he hates sin. Uh, you know, this teaching of he just can't look at sin. Well, if he can't look at sin, then he couldn't look at anybody that's not a believer right now. But he loves them, and while they're yet in sin, he sent Christ to die for us. So we have to change the lens, and he's talking to us as sons. He is a father disciplining his son. He's concerned about the end result. Not talking about heaven. He's talking about your abundant life on the planet, how you're going to turn out while you live here on the earth. Because, folks, tonight what we're sharing with you is why people walk out of the building and say, well, they just preach you can live any way you want to live. Because they don't think we're disciplined. They think we just slap grace on everything, and I do. But I slap grace in, on, on everything with sloppy agape and all that love because he's talking to me as a son, and he wants me to be better than I am. Because the way, the way I'm acting is not who I am. And he wants me to act like who I am, but he doesn't want me to act like that to become who I am. I already am who I'm supposed to be, and he wants me to act like it. Does that make sense? Verse 7. If you endure chastening, here again, same exact phrase as instruction and discipline. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? If he doesn't love you, he wouldn't bring discipline. Okay, This is not, oh, you screwed up, so I'm going to make you run ten laps, say five Hail Marys, wear sackcloth and ashes, and I, you know, if you don't give 100% of your income over the next five weeks, then I'm not going to bless you. That's, that's not the way the father is talking to a son. I mean, my dad disciplined me and corrected me. He never withheld food from me. He never kicked me out of the house. He didn't take my clothes away from me. He didn't make me go outside and use leaves to wipe my hind in. 
but he disciplined me, training me. Why? Because I was a right, and he wanted better for me, and he wanted me to act like I was a right. That's why it's not because he hated me. It's not because he wanted ill will to come up on me. He never pushed me out in front of cars. He never broke my leg to teach me a lesson. Okay? And that's not the way our Heavenly Father treats us. I had a good example of what a father, uh, our Heavenly Father is like. Okay, so he is dealing with you as a son. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline for cultivation? He's preparing you to make you better. Verse 8, here it is again, but if you are without chastening, if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are not sons. But if you are without chastening, in other words, he's saying to us that, don't forget the exhortation that I gave you as sons, I'm chasing you because I love you, we're all partakers in this chastening, but if you're not going to be a partaker in it, then you're illegitimate. You're not a son. And if you're not a son, you're a stranger and a vagabond. In other words, he's saying, I don't know you. If you don't want to take the discipline to make yourself better than I'm trying to give to you, you're not listening to my instructions, son. Go back to Proverbs and read what he says in Proverbs. My son, give ear to my instruction. It's, that's how we gain wisdom. So discipline is preparatory, not penal. What do you mean? It's not about punishment. You have to get the mentality that God is punishing you and wipe it out of your mind. How many of you have ever felt that God was out to get you? Throughout life, that God was out to get you. Where did you get that teaching? Where, how did that mindset enter in? Give me some feedback. I'm sorry? Blaming what you didn't understand. You don't understand God, so you just blame God. He's out to get you. Anybody else? Your grandmother told you that. God's going to get you. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody else? Motive, being trying to motivate someone by fear. Yeah, and so because of that... Kids, starting at a young age downstairs, uh, can have a wrong concept of who their Heavenly Father is and live years of frustration and guilt because they think God's out to punish them. Can I give an illustration? Absolutely. Pastor Mike Ramsey gave me permission. Now, I used it Sunday. His first time to church, he rode a church bus. And when he got there, he'd never been in church. When he got there, he ran up the steps. A man in the church grabbed him, pulled him into a classroom, pulled down his pants, and spanked him, and told him, don't run in the church. If you didn't hear that on the internet, a pastor here locally said that his very first experience of going to church was riding a church bus, and when he got there, he ran up the steps, and a man in the church grabbed him, took him in the classroom, pulled his pants down and busted his hind end and said, don't run in church. Now, what do you think that did to that child? Oh, he was scared to go to church. And if he's scared to go to church, then what do you think he thought of God? If this is what a human being will do to me, what is this all-powerful God going to do to me? So people have a punishment view and not a preparatory view of God when it comes to discipline. And you've got one of two categories. They either have quit because it's too hard or they've never tried it because they're, they don't want anything to do with that God that's so mean. And a lot of that, I, I believe that we could point to the pulpits where the pulpits can take full responsibility for uh, an, a view of God that is incorrect. Help us, Jesus. That's why it's important for us to hear from the Holy Spirit before we speak. How are you going to... Okay, now here, let's talk about a couple of disciplines in righteousness. How are you going to be prepared to declare who you are if you don't ever read the Word? If you don't ever open up the Scriptures, if the only time you open up the, your, your 
little scripture on your Bible or you literally open up the scripture is on Sundays and Wednesdays and most just come on Sundays and some don't even come on Sundays but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Bible reading is not a have to but it is a discipline. You cannot be prepared to give an answer for the joy that you have. You can't give the, because the word, um, the scriptures... Uh, that are inspired is what Jesus used to ward off the enemy when he began to attack him. Amen. So when you get an attack in your mind, it, it, look, I'll tell you something right now. You will never memorize a scripture and be able to use it if you've not studied it, read it, ate it up, gone over it back and forward, and you know it inside and out. You won't be able to memorize it. You're not going to memorize a scripture that I say once every five weeks. And if you do, you just regurgitate it and you really haven't put it in your memory. Now see, again, you have to take this view out that I'm not doing this to get something from God. You've all received, received of His fullness, John 1.16 says, grace upon grace. And so if you've received from His fullness grace upon grace, what work can you get to get more fullness from God? So we're not talking about earning something from God as a, to get righteousness, favor, or sins forgiven, or anything, anything in that nature. We're talking about how can you be prepared to declare who you are if you don't open up the Scripture? Because, see, I have, I have a, a feeling that a lot have walked away saying, well, Pastor Jamie says I don't have to read the Bible. You don't. You don't have to read the Bible. You get to. And if you will read it, you'll be, you will gain discipline and you will be able to declare who you are in this world. But if you just take for instance, I told you Sunday morning, right now, because of the blood of Jesus, I'm qualified. But if you just regurgitate that and that's a positive confession, that's wonderful. But if you've not gotten into the, opened up the scripture to read what you're qualified to do and to have and to be, then you'll just walk around saying, I'm qualified and have no idea what you're talking about. You won't, but we need to be prepared to declare who we are and we get prepared to declare who we are because see, from cover to cover, page to page, the volume of the books is written of Him. So when you open it up and you see Him, it's a reflection of who you are. So the more knowledge you gain about who He is, the more knowledge you gain about who you are. But if you never open it up, you'll never find out who He is. So it is important, it is a discipline that God wants us to have in righteousness, not for righteousness. See that little preposition? It's in righteousness, not for righteousness. Because when you believed, placed your faith and your trust in Him, you received His righteousness and you are righteous, but you need to know why you're righteous and how to declare that. And you're only going to find it when you open up the Scripture. So I encourage you not just to read it. See, I don't know, you all have heard me blurt this out a few times, but see, I was always, I wanted to read the Bible every year. It was my goal to read the Bible every year so I could say hey, I had read the Bible every year. I'm doing my part. So I would read three in the old, two in the new, one proverb and one Psalms. If you do that, you read through Proverbs every month. And then you read three in the old and two in the new, and you've read through the Bible in a year. So, so really, reading the Bible is not as important as studying it. So to me now, it doesn't matter if you get stuck in the, the Gospel of Luke for five months. As long as you're getting in there, and you're finding out who Jesus is, and what He's done for you, who he's made you to become and it ministers to you, you might get stuck on one word. And, you know, I've looked at discipline all my life and in the scripture, but learned something new this past week about discipline. And now seeing changing the lens and making it preparatory. So Bible reading is not a have to, but you get to, and if you'll do it, it becomes a discipline in your life that is a discipline in righteousness that will help you to be a better Christian. Hmm. If you just take my word for it, you're being indoctrinated and undisciplined. 
Or if you just take any preacher's word for it, you're becoming in, see, that's a fear here. If all you do is come and listen to us, then you're becoming indoctrinated. Open up the scripture, find out who you really are in Christ and declare what you find about who you are in the scripture. I think that's good teaching. How am I going to know how to pray for you if I don't ever pray? I've heard my parents say, I've heard other spiritual leaders say, the only way to learn how to pray is to start praying. Now again, Prayer, this is not so that you can gain more favor with God. This is not so that you can say that I'm holier than this one or I pray. I used to take a stopwatch into the, to the closet. And I heard this Pastor Paul White when he was talking about this. He, he broke his prayer up into 12 five-minute segments. He'd do five minutes of repentance, five minutes of confession, five minutes of praise, five minutes of... Uh, but I took my stopwatch in there just to make sure that I got at least 10 or 15 minutes in, in prayer without falling asleep. I usually set an alarm on my little watch so that I, you know, and can I just be honest with you? And so then I could say I prayed because I was taught read, pray, witness, and obey every day. Josh is shaking his head. He knows that. Read, pray, witness, and obey. And I read, prayed, witnessed, and obeyed and felt like I was going to hell in a handbasket. Okay? Why? Because I was trying to do it to keep the punishment of God off of me, not doing it as a discipline to be prepared to face the world and the system that's in the world. All those things are good. Read, pray, witness, and obey. Wonderful things. But those good works don't save you. They are good works that we do to prove that we are righteous. See how we change the lens? See how we're just putting the cart before the horse? You will never know the voice of God if you never pray. And so the world will throw all kinds of voices at you. The enemy will throw the voices of you know, success and fame and fortune and all these different voices that are coming at you. And no wonder people say, well, how do I know the voice of God? Well, have you prayed recently? Again, it's not about trying to gain favor from God. You already have favor with God and he wants to talk to you. He wants to spend time with you, but you'll never be prepared to pray for others if you never spend time praying. See how this is a discipline? This is things that we're fixing now so that when it's game time, we don't have to work on them. It becomes second nature to us. We don't have to think about it. Pastor Carl Roundtree told us for years, if you'll do your emergency praying now, when an emergency comes up, you won't have to beat the altar to try to get God's attention. <laughs> How am I going to learn how to have community and learn what my brothers and sisters' burdens are and lift those burdens to the Lord if I never attend church? If, you, if you're never in the community, how can you ever experience community? We have a lot of close, dear friends, wonderful friends, and they're with us and they're believers, but they don't attend church. And so they can't know what your need is to lift your need before the Lord because they've not been around you for the past four months. We need each other. Together we're better. Iron sharpens iron. We can encourage one another. We can bear one another's burdens. It's wonderful to pick up the telephone and talk or to text, but if you're never touching and feeling and hugging and getting that nourishment and that fellowship and that encouragement, no wonder people die, spiritually speaking. I'm not talking about dying. They, they die because they don't come to church. It's a discipline. It's good for us to come. To, uh, it's a dose. It's, a, it's like a steroid shot of the Holy Ghost when we come together. And we get encouraged. And plus, I believe at Grace Life, if you'll come to church, you'll leave better than, feeling better than when you came in. Because you're going to hear good news. You're going to be encouraged. Your spirit man is going to be ministered to. You're not going to be beat down and drugged through the mud and called awful names by God's grace. I'm not telling you you have to do these things. See, because that's what we've had for years. We've had people tell us that we had to do certain things, and if we didn't do certain things, then God withheld certain things from us. That's punishment. He's preparing us. He's preparing us to become more of who we really are in Christ. We spend time in the Word. We see a reflection of Him in us. We spend time talking to him. We learn his voice. We learn how to pray for others, bear one another's burdens. We come together. We give. Didn't expect any amens on that one. 
But the more disciplined you are in righteousness, the more prepared you are to look like, act like, and talk like sons. But the reason that people aren't looking like, acting like, and talking like sons is they're not disciplined. This should have been a Sunday morning message. Uh, because we all need to learn dis the discipline of righteousness, the instruction in righteousness. The less prepared you are, the more you will look like, act like, and talk like strangers. You won't know who your daddy is. So little discipline in righteousness is knowing. So discipline in righteousness is knowing what Scripture says. It's understanding how important community is. And it's knowing the Father's voice. Talking about being sons, but not living like sons because we are completely unprepared and overwhelmed in the worldly system because of the lack of discipline. There is a lack of discipline in the church. And I'm not talking about grace life and the few that are here. I'm talking about collectively the body of Christ. When George Barner reports that less than 10% of self-proclaiming Christians pick up the Bible in a week. Less than 10% of self-proclaiming Christians pick up the Bible to read it in a week. We're undisciplined. Now, and thank God for His grace. Thank God for His grace. I'm telling you, thank God for His grace because if it, if it hinged on us picking up the Bible... 90% of us aren't even going to make it. But it doesn't hinge on that, but it will prepare us and make us better sons. So instruction in righteousness, not, not for righteousness. Prepared to know the voice of daddy in a world system that will send all kinds of voices at you. I got there, all right. There's no substitute for preparation. There's no substitute for it. Uh, our praise team practices. They get together, they practice, they spend time together learning the songs. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit directs us in a different vein, and we know that, and Michaela flows with that. I'm thankful that she's open to just flowing. With it. But they prepare. She prepares through the week. She makes charts. She plays the songs over and over again. They practice together. Uh, if I just got up here and won it and didn't have any notes or prepared for it, most of you wouldn't uh, won it. <laughs> if I just won it. <laughs> it's the Greek, that's right. <laughs> All right. I want to give you, I'm going to ask you a couple questions and then I'll let you go here. Was Jesus disciplined? Here's a couple examples. In Luke, the fourth chapter, when he goes to the synagogue and he prepares to read from Isaiah the scroll, less than 3% in Jesus' day could read. That means if a hundred people were in the synagogue that day, only three of them could read. And he was one of them. So he had disciplined himself to study the scripture, to read the scripture, because when the scroll was unrolled, it said he found the, the place where it was written. Now he didn't have chapter and verse. So they unroll this large scroll and he's able to read through it quickly and browse through it. And he, he was a fast reader and he found the spot. I'll give you a little joke about a fast reader. There was a church that did responsive readings every Sunday morning. And there was one lady who was always ahead. I mean, she would be reading before the pastor even finished his part of the responsive reading. And so the pastor got up and he said, this morning we're going to say in unison to Genesis 3. He said... When you, that lady back there that's fast, when you get to the still water, some of us are still pastors, so just wait a minute. <laughs> but Jesus disciplined himself and read the scripture and was aware of where to find Isaiah 61 and that portion of scripture and to read it. We should be disciplined and prepared and cultivate our souls in the reading of the scripture so that we can go to the place when we need it and find that word that will encourage our spirit. In Luke, the fifth chapter, he's healing people all over the place. The multitudes are coming to him, and he's healing them all over the place, and he pulls away to go and pray. Now, we would have said, my goodness, he left the multitudes from healing them to go pray. He was disciplined, and he knew what would happen if he went away to pray. 
He said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. How was he going to know what the Father tells him to do if he wasn't spending time talking to him? Um, okay. Disciplines of righteousness, not of self-performance. If, if Bible reading is no longer enjoyable, if prayer becomes is no longer beneficial, if church attendance is no longer important, if giving is no longer cheerful, you're prostituting the disciplines of God. What do you mean you're prostituting them? You're whoring them out in order to get something. And the discipline of instruction and righteousness is not for you to gain something. It's to prepare you, to train you, to educate you, and to cultivate you. 1 John 2.20 2, says, You have an anointing from the Holy One. Verse 27 of 1 John 2 says, The anointing you have received abides in you. How do you receive that? When you believed. But you can cultivate that through reading, praying, worshiping, giving. You can cultivate that. Steward that grace that He's already given you. I want to end with this story. You've heard me preach on it before. But there's only two places in the New Testament where a fire of coals, really if we would say it was a charcoal fire. And there's only two places that it's found. The first place that it's found is after uh, Jesus has been arrested and Peter kind of follows and sneaks around and he ends up in the courtyard at Caiaphas's house. We've been there. We're going back in March of 2019. It'd be $318 a month if you start saving right now. That's pretty easy to do. Sell a few kids and uh, have a yard sale. But, and get disciplined in giving. Yeah. So he's in the courtyard and there's a fire and you know the story. Before the cock crows, he denies that he even knew Christ three times. And he runs away sorrowful. He's weeping, okay? The smell of that fire is, all, is on him. So for the next three days as Jesus is buried in the tomb, Peter didn't go wash his prayer shawl. Every time he puts his prayer shawl over his head, his head, he smells that fire and he remembers that he has denied Christ and he continues to weep bitterly. You know the story, he's resurrected. Now Peter has gone back to, to fishing and he's out in the boat and Jesus is along the shore, the seashore of the Galilee and he begins to call out to his disciples and Peter recognizes him and he jumps in the water and he swims into shore and Jesus has already prepared a charcoal fire, a fire of coals. Now, so watch where I'm going. If Peter has a preconceived assumption that discipline is punishment and not preparation, he's about to get the hell beat out of him. Because Jesus, this is his, if this is his mindset, if he's not changed his lens then, he's going to get a foot up his hind end. Because you denied me, you cursed me, you denied you ever knew me. Why did you do that? How come you didn't go tell people that I had raised the dead man? How come you didn't go tell people I had opened up blind eyes? How come you didn't come to my rescue when you saw them beating me and arresting me? He said, yeah, you cut somebody's ear off, but you didn't, step, you didn't stand up for me, Peter. See, that's a mentality that you will have that God's punishing you for something that you've done and really what he wants to do is to prepare you. He doesn't want to scold you. He wants to encourage you. And around that fire, he begins to tell him, if you love me, not you would have done this or you would have done that. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. And the only way you can feed my sheep is if you're prepared to feed them. So we, as pastors, as ministers, as people of God, we want to use the scriptures to, for correction, for discipline in righteousness to prepare you not to beat you up. That's our goal at Grace Life. So now when he smells the smoke from the fire, he's not remembering that he denied Christ. He's remembering that Christ has forgiven him and given him an assignment because he loves him. So now the, when he smells that smoke, 
You know, if you've ever smelled, I, if I smell cinnamon, hard cinnamon candy, it's going to take me back to 16th Street and Nitro where my mama has a big marble slab out and she's cracking that hard candy. I can remember that. When I smell that, that's what I think about. So now when Peter smells a charcoal fire, it's going to take him back to the time that God forgave him, that Jesus shed his love on him and gave him an assignment and prepared him to feed his lambs. Mm. All right. Good. That's it. Any questions or comments? I'm sorry? Abruptly? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I covered everything. I think a lot of times what the problem is, is, is we try to balance out. Preachers are guilty of this a lot. God really loves you. And see, we've got this, but he's just. And he, he rules in judgment. So if you've done this, then here's the judgment of God. But then we have to balance it out and start preaching the love of God. And so we've got this balancing act on the scales that we're trying to balance out the love of God and the judgment of God. God took care of all the judgment at the cross. Jesus himself said, now is the judgment of this world come. Now is the prince of this world been cast out. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all. Period. That next phrase isn't in the original language. This he spoke by, of his death by crucifixion. In other words, he said, if I be lifted up and crucified, I'll draw all judgment to myself. And if I've drawn all judgment to myself, there's no pending judgment if you'll accept it. And so uh, there's no balancing act. God does chasten or discipline in righteousness and, and instruct us and train us to cultivate in us who we really are so that we can declare that. Amen? Amen. Good. Hope that tr I trust that that ministered. To yes. Do you think it's fair to say that because we have such a lack of discipline or training in church, particularly because we don't reinforce it there, that people will let us pray because like Jesus said, the Lord is because of this discipline. Satan tried to lead them astray by quoting the Lord. Mm -hmm. But he knew who he was, so it wasn't taken into view. He wasn't led astray by the false teachings. Yeah, and if we aren't prepared in the word when the enemy comes and tries to attack us in our identity, if we're not disciplined in the righteous act of reading the scripture so that we are prepared, those accusations just mount against us and then we fight a mental battle constantly about who we are in Christ. Uh, that's why it's important to read the scripture because in our reading of it, we find out it's, it's, it's all about him. It's Jesus. And we are hidden in him and that we find ourselves, our identity is in Christ. So the more we find out and learn about him, then we learn about our identity. And then we use those, see he used the word, he used the scripture when his identity was attacked to remind him of who he was because his identity wasn't based on performance. Watch. God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The very first attack from the enemy, if thou be, then do. See, the enemy wants you to perform something. But if you can't come back with him, well, I know who I am. And because I know who I am, it is written, and I'm a son of God. And you, you ward off those attacks of, your, of the enemy in your mind about who you are in Christ. That's, that's been the attack since the beginning. The enemy came in to Adam and Eve and said, if you'll eat of this tree, he knows that you will be like him. They were already like him. They were created in his likeness and in his image. Uh, so that's been the attack since the very beginning. So when the last Adam shows up, what does he do? He starts off by trying to attack his identity. He has no new tricks. He only has the power uh, to try to uh, accuse the brethren. Uh, and that accusation goes nowhere because he's only accusing you to you. He can't go to heaven and accuse you of doing anything to God. He has no access to God. Well, he does if he wants to come through Jesus and the blood. And if he does that, then he'll, then he'll have no accusations. He'll be your brother. Amen. Anything else? Anybody else have a question? Do I see a hand? Is there another? Make sure there's no questions here. Okay. Good. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
So yeah. Obviously, don't go kill your husband. He's going to tempt you with a good work, but it's really a dead work because you're finding your identity. Mm -hmm. You need a microphone. Yeah, he, the enemy, will try to get you to do a good work that's really a dead work. So he's not going to try to get you to kill your wife, kill your husband. He wants you to do a good work for yeah to find your identity in that, and then but your identity is found in the finished work. Not a good work. Which was a good work and a finished work, but we're resting in that walking in it. Yeah. Can you all hear her? Yeah. I'll say it Sunday. She'll say it Sunday, she said. <laughs> okay. Well, let's stand. Well, good. If your daddy had allowed you to be disciplined by using a pig leaf, we would have saved a lot of money on board. <laughs> Uh, uh. <laughs> oh, that was good, Mom. If you didn't hear her, you'll have to ask her. <laughs> We're thankful that Gary made it back and is out of the hospital, and God touched him, and uh, he's doing well. Good to see Nora, yeah, doing well. Amen. We're thankful. Thank you all for coming this evening uh, and allowing us to to share our hearts with you and trust to encourage you. All of you that watched by the internet, there was, gosh, a bunch tonight. I hope that because you all tagged people and they, they watched that they learned something tonight as well and they were encouraged uh, with that. This past Sunday morning I taught on uh, he's taken this out of your life and made disqualified qualified. And this Sunday morning I'm preaching. The Lord took me to... Uh, He's taking the diss out of your disappointment and giving you an appointment. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, did I see a hand somewhere? Yes. I just want to say a couple weeks ago, they kind of were lost. Yes. So, and what they want to know, they're going to be each day. I think I'll put on the chairs that I'm faithful. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes, that's good. Good point of contact. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For children, we have the little stuffed owls and um, birds that... Uh, we have printed with Grace Life on them, and we will anoint those for prayer cloths for children, infants, toddlers, that we can take them into the nurseries and uh, hospitals if we need to, which uh, is a good point of contact as well. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yep, they're right over there. So if you need one, let us know. All right. Would you just bow your heads and lift your arms and just begin? Yes. Yeah. Yes. See a believer? comfort. May his passing be one of peace. We pray, Father, that you would give Kathy strength and the rest of her family. This is a time where she needs to feel the comfort of Holy Spirit surrounding her. So, Father, may she feel your love as you embrace her and her family. May she continue to lift her head high and look to you, the author and finisher of her faith. We pray, Father, that you would give her a confident reassurance of her father's salvation, that he will spend eternity with you because of the blood of Jesus. All these other requests for little ones that are sick and for uh, even moms and dads and adults that are ill in their body with symptoms, uh, we declare and decree healing to be manifested in their body. They are whole, well, and healed. 
We speak life into dead relationships. We speak life into dead finances. We speak life into dead end jobs. We speak life into uh, dead uh, spiritual uh, conditions. We speak life into dead uh, marriages this evening. We just speak life and that more abundant because that's what you came to give us. And we thank you in Jesus' name.